Welcome to the Insights Unlocked podcast. I'm Nathan Isaacs, Senior Manager for Content Production at User Testing. And joining us today as host is User Testing's Leah Hogan, Principal for Experience Research Strategy. Welcome, Leah. Hi. And our guest today is Jennifer Romano. Jen is a leader in the UX industry, whether as a keynote speaker, consultant, or coach. She has directed UX initiatives at Google, Facebook, and Instagram. She is past president of the User Experience Professional Association, co-author of several UX research books, and an instructor at UC Berkeley and the University of Maryland. Welcome to the show, Jen. Hello, and thank you so much for having me. Well, Jen, again, welcome to the show. I'm really excited to have this conversation today. Um, you've got so much history and background and experience, both inside of academia and inside industry. And so where I wanted to, to go first with you today is, we talked a little bit about this before we started today's conversation formally, um, is where do you see um, UX going? Where are we now? What are some of the things that are top of mind for you as someone who really is at that intersection of you know, trying to bridge that divide between the academy and industry. Oh, well, where are we right now with the industry? Uh, great question. It seems to be a really hot topic right now that everybody wants to know and predict. I wish I had a crystal ball, uh, but I'll give you my version of the crystal ball. <laughs> um, as um, I, we, you know, we're probably all in agreement. It's a little rocky right now. There have been a lot of layoffs. Uh, there's a lot of people who are looking for roles. There are fewer roles than people available for those roles. We're especially seeing this with the entry level roles. Um, however, we are seeing a lot of job postings and literally I feel like just in the past couple weeks, so maybe what's happening, if I were to look into my little crystal ball, is the companies tightened their belts, had layoffs, tightened their budgets, expected people to work with less, but now we're rolling into Q2. So maybe we're seeing a change in Q2, right? Q1 was all the planning. This is what all the companies do in Q1. They come back from the holiday break and figure out what we're going to do for the year and if anything has changed from what they were discussing at the end of the year. So maybe things have changed and now we're going to see more hiring and budgets opening up in Q2. Um, I, I, I believe that's what's taking place just based on all of the job postings that we've seen. And I repost a lot of them on LinkedIn. I'm careful to post recent ones. So for any of you who are po reposting, which I think it's awesome that we're all reposting and giving those opportunities to people who may not have seen them let's make sure we're posting recent ones because sometimes people are reposting something from like two months ago and maybe it's still open, right? But there's so many new ones too that we could be sharing all the fresh content. I've been seeing entry level, recent graduate, internship postings, and then I'm seeing um, director level, lead level, right? And, and anything in between. I'm seeing researcher, designer, content, project manager, product manager. So it's like all the roles, which is wild to me when you think about all the layoffs that occurred, you know? So I don't, I wish I, I were a fly on the wall, you know, back in my Google days, my Facebook days, I wish I was a fly on the wall in all those conversations that are occurring now. But I do see that opening up. The other thing that has occurred is um, there has been a, um, what do we want to call it? Like a parallel right now of um, both full-time roles and consultant roles have kind of been on hold, on pause, you know, tightening the belt across the board. So what I'm hoping is happening too is budgets are opening up and consultant roles are going to pick up again because that that has been an interesting difference. People who've been around for a long time talk about this wave that occurs. And, you know, it happens in all industries when you think about it. Right now, money is expensive, loans, interest rates. Yeah, everything is more expensive. So it's not just our field that experiences these waves. But people who've been in UX for a long time talk about previous waves when there were tightening of the belts. But this appears to be 
the first time, at least in a really long time, where both consultant roles and full-time roles have simultaneously been, let's call it, struggling. So I'm, I'm, I'm seeing that opening up. As far as the field, the thing to remember is UX is still so new. Literally user experience, the, the term is still so new. You know, it was, it was usability not that long ago. So when you think about the field and how many companies still don't have UX research, UX design, how many people still don't even know what it is? I mean, when you tell people your job, how many people are like, what's UX? And you still have to say, you have to still, you know, go back to that elevator pitch of, of what it even is and explain to people what UX even is. Because it's not, it's still new. The field is not saturated. There are still so many opportunities for growth in our field. I wanted to kind of follow up just a little bit about the the job market and where it is that you see the types of roles seen. Because I think in addition to all those roles that you just mentioned, I am seeing more either mixed methods or quantitative research role opening up. And, you know, I would say that my experience in UX has been people have primarily lived in that qualitative space, but we're now seeing a much greater emphasis um, on the part of the business for fluency around just how to manage behavioral analytics, attitudinal analytics, and also have you know, an understanding of how to build really rigorous, meaningful, empathic data as well. So I just wanted to get a sense for, I know you're teaching and you're probably thinking about how do I prepare people for the job market? Is that something that you're really developing skills, you know, curricula, you know, information, yeah, there is definitely a need. So I agree that there has been a bit of a shift from qual, although it's it, qual is not dead, it's not going anywhere. But you know, maybe this has to do with the tightening of the belt, where people are expected to do more with less. Qual researchers are expected to do more, and the first thing they're expected to do is surveys. So basic surveys, even if you don't run intricate analyses, statistics, it's okay. But learning how to ask questions correctly and design surveys correctly, people take that for granted and think, oh, anybody can create a survey, but it is a skill. So that's number one. You know, if you want to be uh, marketable, if you want to have more tools in your toolkit beyond the, the typical qualitative interview skills that most researchers have, then getting skilled at survey design, um, conducting surveys, I think that's like the next logical step. If you're not into quant, if you're not into numbers, you're not into stats, that's not your thing, then don't do it. You know, like I, I it's like saying um, the other the other trend that we see that um, people are asking a lot about too is being a designer and researcher in one, the unicorn, right? Which we've talked about for years about being the unicorn. And my response is, if you want to be the unicorn, if you like both doing research and doing design, then sure, there are opportunities out there. And while there's a lot of companies tightening the belts, and, and then still, as there always has been, the startups who are just starting off and they need they only have one role and they want it to be a researcher, designer in one. If that's your thing, if that's what you're into, awesome, go for it. And I feel the same about quantitative really quantitative research. If that's your thing, if you like it, then go for it because there is a need for it. If not, if you're a qualitative person, if you're just a researcher, look, I'm not a designer. And if somebody wanted me to be a researcher and designer in one, I'd be like, I, I'm sorry, you'll be wildly disappointed. Let me bring on an amazing designer because I'm not a designer. I love design and I love to design physical space. But when it comes to digital space, I'd rather hire somebody who knows how to do it exceptionally well. Um, so if you're a researcher and you don't want to do design, don't do design. If you're a qualitative researcher and you don't want to learn statistics and R and Python and all those things, don't. But I do recommend getting well-versed in surveys as, as another tool in your toolkit. Um, similarly, and this is still qualitative, we're seeing a rise in diary studies. So like get well-versed in how to conduct diary studies. We're moving beyond the, the classic um simply 
doing interviews and usability tests. While those are still important, those are fundamental, let's not lose those because that's another thing. With the tightening of the belt, we heard a lot of you know researchers are losing their seat at the table. They're trying to be really innovative, but meanwhile, they're losing sight of keeping the lights on. What do we need to do to improve the product? The classic usability studies to figure out what's working well, what's working, what's not working well, and how to improve the product to for our users, right? Like we don't want to lose that. So don't lose the classic usability studies and the in-depth interviews, but think about what other tools to add to the toolkit. You know, and I would say surveys, diary studies are the next in line. Um, there have been fancy things in our I don't want to say in our history. There are fancy things like eye tracking, which is a passion methodology of mine. Eye tracking and biometrics and uh, facial emotion recognition. Those things are still nice to have. So I'm not seeing those really taking off in terms of what people are looking, what companies are looking for in their researchers, you know, but surveys for sure. Yeah, I think probably the reason why we're not seeing as much of that is the logistics of actually following through on a lot of that biometric research because, you know, it's not super easy to do remotely. And, you know, remote research has been critical over the last several years, right? It really requires you to be in a place synchronously um, so that you can capture all that data. So totally get it. I will say, let me just add to surveys. So one of the benefits of surveys is um, scaling. Right, you could do a small study, small sample, figure out what those problems are. You don't need a lot of people to understand that there's a problem, that there's a roadblock and people cannot complete a task. That's fine. But when we wanna understand larger scale, larger samples, uh, user sentiment, right? That's where we get into surveys. We're not using surveys to understand how people do things. That doesn't make sense. We're using surveys to understand what people think, um, what their perceptions are, you know, things like this. However, with the remote testing tools, as you are very aware of, right, these are also, we're seeing a, a rise in because it's about scale. So now we can use, we've got surveys to understand lots of people and their perceptions and their attitudes. But then we have tools like user testing where we can conduct a lot of in-depth interview, well, kind of in-depth interviews, usability studies though, really, right? Like asking people, we can still ask people and get recordings, um, ask people what they think, you know, so kind of uh, an in-depth interview as well, but more the usability test. And we could do that at scale. So we're seeing a rise in these tools as well. These tools also help us scale the team. So while the companies are tightening their belts and maybe they're not, maybe there's no longer a team of 10 researchers, there's only a team of five, well, now those five researchers can use these tools to still conduct a lot of studies. So that's like another another thing, which, it, you know, it's kind of quant because it's, it's um, scaling and it's a large sample size, but still not quant in terms of like the analysis. You know, when, when we think about quantitative research, quant UX research roles, those tend to be um, looking at big, big sample sizes, big data sets and analysis, you know, and, and the ability to use R and Python and other tools like that. But mixed methods, I think you're right. We're seeing a rise in mixed methods, which is, you know, the qual. Qual researchers, by the way, usually don't do qual, right? So that's like a completely separate divide. They are strictly quant and qual is strictly qual. And then the mixed methods is something in the middle. Yeah. Absolutely seeing that. And I mean, you even see it in the backgrounds and qualifications and interests and just in every way they are separate disciplines. Yeah. yeah. Not the same. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And some companies, um, the quant, let me think of how this goes. So when I was at Facebook, the quantitative researchers were strictly conducting surveys and intricate surveys where they're weighting the data. Right, mixed methods researchers often aren't doing. Like I, I'm a mixed methods researcher, and I'm very skilled at survey, survey design. I teach about surveys and everything, but I'm not weighting the data. Like I would pull in an expert to do that, those kinds of analyses. Um, but anyway, so at Facebook, the quantitative researcher was doing that kind of work, and the data scientist was looking at the analytics, at what people are actually doing in the product time on page and where people are clicking and what day of what time of day and things like that 
at Google, the quantitative researcher was doing that. So quantitative researcher was looking at the analytics. So this is important too. If, if people are interested in quanty things, find out what that means at the different companies because it may mean different things. It does mean different things. You know, or if you're really skilled at surveys and weighting data and that kind of thing. In some companies, that may be called a survey methodologist, right? That may not be called a quantitative UX researcher. That may not be called a data scientist. It may be called a survey methodologist, right? So depending on what you're interested in, then you can go out from there, see what the different companies call these different roles. Yeah. And I think to your point, I, I'm seeing surveys being used across the product development life cycle too. Whereas, you know, the, and I come from survey world from having been at 4C and Varens. So just a little bit of a different perspective there, which was really around, you know, attitudes, behaviors, intent, and um, really working mostly at quantitative scale, weighting and everything else. Um, what I'm seeing our customers actually at user testing asking for is more quality surveys like you know I think about quanti qual and quali quant but surveys that are really as you said like more about asking qualitative questions of larger groups of people larger sample sizes versus really trying to understand how true of this is the entire population and those are different surveys and they're done at different points in time and they're really about addressing different objectives yeah absolutely yeah. What I still will stand by is that I don't think surveys should be used to measure behavior. And we still see researchers doing that. And I, I cringe at that. You know, we don't want to ask people, you know, thinking about the last time you used it, like, what was your, what was, um, oh, I can't even think off the top of my head. Like, what was your, this is going to be horrible. What was your biggest pain point? You know, it's like, we need to be observing and and asking people to remember the last time they used a product and the problems they had while they were trying to do a thing. I mean, try to remember, try to tell me what you were doing a half hour ago and the pain point you had a half hour ago. You know what I mean? Using this platform that we're using. It's like, it's impossible or really, really difficult to answer that and to get accurate data. But researchers still do it. And then we end up making decisions, assumptions based on this data. And it's really not the best methodology for that. You know, for that, we really want to see people using the product. And that's, again, where like products like user testing really come into play because we can do that at scale. We don't need to worry about talking to 100 people across the world of different demographics, right? We can easily do that with user testing all in literally a matter of hours, you know, or less for that matter. So like, I, I really encourage that because then there's what ends up happening is there is an over usage of surveys. <laughs> People learn that methodology and then they think that's the end all and that's what they should use for everything. And it's like, no, 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 this is another tool in the toolkit. And depending on what you want to learn, we'll figure out what methodology is best. Yeah. And, and to that point, we actually had someone reach out last week and say, what are some principles that you would share for people who are not researchers to be better consumers of human insights. And so I've been thinking a lot about this. So if you, and, and I ask this question because of a point that you just made, that researchers are sometimes asking bad, I say bad questions with quotation marks, around behaviors, I think partially because they're trying to please a business partner, right? Who doesn't understand that that's actually not a great way to collect that information. But they're doing it because somebody comes to them and says like, hey, can you do a survey for me? And people are kind of taking orders and, and doing that literal work. So if you were gonna recommend a few principles to people who are not researchers to be better consumers of feedback, insights, data, what would you tell them? Finn. So people who are not researchers, Mm -hmm. how to be better users of the data. Yeah. You know, that's a quick, that's a great question. I wonder if pointing them to publicly available content that is, 
usable, that is user friendly, right? It's not jargony like much of our industry um, language and reports are. You know, like I'm thinking about Pew. Pew Research Center puts out great research reports. Um, you know, I wonder if we can point people to things like that. And maybe, maybe this is a call for something like this in our field. Maybe we need this. You know, we're kind of a repository. Uh, then it requires people to actually be contributing to it, which is a whole nother <laughs> thing that, you know, could be problematic difficult to get people to keep up with. I'll tell you, I've been at a number of organizations where we've had these internally, these kind of repositories, and it's really difficult to get people to stick with them. We had that at um, at Census. I think it was actually across a number of organizations where we tried to put in our survey, any survey research findings so we can learn from each other. And, you know, people just, people are busy and that's not, that's like a secondary or tertiary job to their main job. We had these repositories at Google and at Facebook, they were just internal, but, you know, again, it ends up being a secondary job. Now you have to go into the portal and you have to put in a lot of information. You have to upload your report and people just don't, they, they don't keep up with it, you know? So I think it would be fabulous for us to have something like that, you know? Maybe this comes back to... Um, like Nielsen Norman, you know, they are putting out articles. I almost said blog posts. I think more like articles, similar though. Um, they're putting out content all the time. I don't know though, that's still pretty industry focused. You know, that's more geared towards UXers. So I don't know. I don't really have an answer for that. I mean, a lot of what we do, and this is something I teach about um, stakeholder alignment and presenting our findings, the same way we create websites and apps and we create materials and we have to think about our users and we need to design and create and build in ways that make sense to our users, not in ways that make sense to us, right? And that's what our whole field is about. That's what our research is about. The same way we're doing that for our products, for our users, we need to do that with our reports, with our data. So who are our users? Who are our business partners? Is it a designer who might understand our, you know, the way we're we're discussing our findings. Is it a VP who doesn't know anything about UX? They just want to know, like, what do we need to do, <laughs> right? Is it somebody else in the company? Is it um, the newspaper? You know, are you being interviewed by the New York Times? Like, who are you giving that information to, and how do they best understand the information? I did a presentation to high school students. Uh, a little while back, and I presented some things that I had have shared <clears throat> through the years about, you know, what we do about my career. It was a it was a career talk, but I really had to go through and make sure I wasn't using you know quote unquote big words. I had to make sure I wasn't using jargon that is very familiar to us, very common to us, because we've been using this language for years and years and years. So it doesn't seem like jargon anymore. But then you're talking to a high school student, and you know they don't understand some things that to us are very simple terms. You know, so so I don't know, maybe it, maybe it's as simple as that. Who are we giving the data to? Or that business partner who says, hey, we need to do a survey. That's their language. What they mean is research. They don't, maybe they say survey because that's all they know. But then it's up to us as researchers to say, hang on, let me show you my toolkit. And what's your research question or what is your question? I'm going to turn it into a research question. But what, what is it you want to know? And now let me show you these tools in my toolkit. Do we need the hammer? Do we need the screwdriver? Do we need the wrench? Do we need the needle nose plier? Right? But if somebody comes to you and says, I need a hammer, well, maybe a hammer would be too specific, but I need a, I need a pliers. Like, well, okay, well, which pliers do we need? What are you trying to do? And now let me show you all the different pliers I have, right? Maybe that's a similar, maybe we need to write up a piece about that. The pliers, if somebody needs a plier, a pair of pliers, like which pliers do you need? But somebody who doesn't know that you have all these different pliers, they may just say, we need a set of pliers, you know? So when a business partner comes to us and says, I have this research, I have this question, let's do a survey. I think it's up to us as researchers to educate a little bit and say, actually, survey is not the best method, method to use. I think we should use in-depth interviews for this reason. Okay, well, we need a large sample. Okay, well, here's what we could do if we need a large sample, right? It's, it's really up to us to educate them about the different methods we use. When I was at, I have, a, I have a, a fun little story about educating our um, stakeholders. When I was at 
Bridgewater, um, I started a UX research practice, right? It's, it's a hedge fund. They had no research practice. I mean, different kinds of research, obviously, financial research, but not UX research at all. And um, I was brought in to do classic UX research, working on apps and, and websites and, and things like that. And it was actually a similar, um, what do you want to call it? Like a similar sentiment, like, oh, you do surveys. You know, you're a UX researcher, you do surveys. And I was like, mm, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes yes. But you know what I did? I actually brought in some senior level people on the team and I had them sit down and participate in a usability study. And I said to them, okay, like now I'm, now I'm going into acting mode, right? Like now I'm going to be the researcher and I'm going to treat you like you are my participant. Um, and I wanted to make that clear because it's like, I wanted them to see this is how we do it. I'm not just sitting here chatting with people and I'm not just doing a survey and I'm not just doing focus groups because that's what people think. That's what people think researchers do if they don't know, you know, what we do. And then I actually ran them through a usability test where they were in the study and it was so... Um, eye-opening for them. You know, each of them was like, oh, this is what you do. I was like, yeah, this is what we do. You know, I, I wanted them to see that I'm not leading people. I'm not coaching people and teaching them how to use the product. You know, I'm just pulling information out of them. I'm sitting there quiet a lot of the time and just giving that verbal, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, letting them know I'm listening. But, you know, they didn't know. They thought it was, you know, yeah, you do surveys. <laughs> You know, so I, I do think that's part of our job, you know, to educate our, our team members who don't know what we do. And if it takes that, have them sit down and participate in a study, show them some recordings, have them observe from the back room, you know, whatever it takes to educate them about our methods. Let's do it. Yeah, I think that that is such a valuable point. And I think it really helps people to get a little bit more control over how it is that they practice their craft as a researcher, too. It really is a conversation and not just a go do this. Yeah. Yeah. And that's how we keep our seat at the table. You know, this has been a, I feel like for years we've talked about like, how does UX get a seat at the table or you have a seat at the table now what, right? Like there's all, all these conversations about getting a seat at the table and that's how it's like, we have to bring our, our team, our stakeholders, our partners along with us and we're educating in a way that's not you know, condescending, of course, in a way that's not like, well, this is how we do it. You know, it's like, no, no, we just bring them along. We show them, this is what I do. It's like bring your kid to work day. You know, let me show you what I do. <laughs> and then you build a relationship and then they know. And then next time they don't come to you and just ask for a survey. Then the next time they come and say, I have this question, help me understand it. Or what are we going to do to understand it? Right. Then they trust that, you know, what you're doing, that you have this toolkit and, you know, it's it's building. And and to your point, I think um, that's it's really important as we come out of this period where there's been a little bit of a pullback. Um, I wanted to really kind of close out the conversation by asking you a question about like artificial intelligence and UX research, because obviously Beyond all the other trends, artificial intelligence, I think, is having a big impact on what I'm seeing um, happening with researcher in the, researchers in the field. So I guess what's your perspective on um, where we are and where we're going with that as, as researchers? Yeah, another hot topic right now. It's like <laughs> the current state and all the layoffs and AI. <laughs> this is what we're all talking about right now. Um, a couple of things come to mind. So first of all, uh, I don't think AI is going to take over our jobs. And that's the biggest fear, right? AI is going to do everything we do and we'll all be out of jobs. I don't think that's going to happen. The analogy I like to use is a calculator. When a calculator was invented, it did not take away the job of the accountants. It helped the accountants be more efficient. So I think for us as researchers, as designers, to learn how to use AI to be more efficient is wise. I think that's really valuable. It's a tool. It's another tool for us to use. Will it ever, will we ever get to the point where AI can do the research, synthesize the findings, create reports that everybody understands? I don't know. I really think we need the 
human component there. You know, there's something about being human and, you know, talking and walking like a human, like all the things that come with being a human that I just don't think AI will do for us. I think it'll be more supplementary and it's up to us to learn how to use it. You know, because really when you think about the time, the amount of time that goes into um, prepping for research or writing reports, you know, and, and that's honestly, um, even when I've partnered with international research partners, it's oftentimes the report, right, or the report, the report that is lacking, you know, so like if we could use AI to help us take the massive amounts of data we have and synthesize it in ways that make sense and that that's helpful and valuable and actionable so we can do the thing we want to do, improve our products, make them better for users, then I think, um, you know, that's that's wise to be able to use AI in that way and to figure out how to best use it. Um, but that's where, that's where I think it's going. The other thing is companies that are investing in AI need researchers to do the research on the AI. So this is like another one. If you're interested in AI, if it's something you're passionate about, I think it's a really great opportunity for the field because a lot of companies are investing in AI, not just the the classic UX companies. Like you can imagine finance and, you know, lots of different companies who use AI, again, as a tool to be more efficient. So us as researchers figuring out not only how we can use it to be more efficient, but how other companies can use AI to be more efficient, right? Like that seems like a, a nice ripe spot for UX researchers to play a role. Yeah. And I think we bring a unique perspective and rigor to the practice of understanding goals, expectations, all of that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Well, that's great. Thank you so much for being on the show today. I've really enjoyed our conversation. Just to let everybody learn a little bit more about you, what are the best ways to kind of keep up with you and what it is that you're thinking about and working on? Oh, thank you so much for asking. So some of my initiatives right now, um, I am consulting, you know, conducting UX research. My my passion things that I'm working on right now are really around training and coaching. And they're really things I've been doing on the side for many, many years. And now that's that's my full-time gig. So you can learn more about the um, training that I have going on. I have a retreat in August in Hawaii that I'm super excited about. That is aiming to bridge a gap where oftentimes people will have boot camps and courses and things like that, but they haven't had real world experience working with clients and conducting field research. So that's a gap that I'm aiming to fill. This is the second time I'm doing the retreat. So really excited about that. You can learn more about that and the other trainings that I have going on at uxrcoach.com. Awesome. Well, that's great. I hope to see you at an upcoming conference. Yes. Yeah. I hope to see you at UXPA. Well, I'll be there. Yeah. In June. So yeah. And, and anybody else, if you're there, let me know and we'll have a chat. Yeah. Sounds great. Well, thanks again for joining us. Thank you so much for having me.